Thank you very much. I'm just going to break with tradition because we haven't yet managed to see how technology works on women's dresses. It's just for the suits. But um, distinguished uh, participants of the high-level panel, let me um, high-level um, corporate dialogue. Let me first express my uh, gratitude to Dr. Pachuria and the team uh, for having me here and, and creating an opportunity to have a, a discussion, a dialogue with business that are clearly going to be one of the most impo new po important new partners that we have on the post-2015 development agenda. Um, it'll be a, a real opportunity to share some of the insights that we have uh, been part of in this journey so far uh, from Rio in trying to get to a definitive sort of framework uh, for the next development agenda. Um, and I think just to set the scene a little that this didn't just sort of start coming out of resolutions of the United Nations at uh, the Rio Plus 20 Sustainable um, Development uh, Summit, but that we started all of this in 2000 in September um, when the MDGs uh, came into being. And, and they really did make a promise to, to address the world's poorest, uh, to look at the most vulnerable, and to try to build a more peaceful and prosperous world. Um, globally, the MDGs have done really well. And, and to begin with, we all looked at them in most developing countries as a minimal agenda. Um, but as we came to engage with them and actually try to implement a set of integrated development goals, we found that quite a task um, in countries where many of our institutions and the capacity to deliver at scale, and I think when we speak in India, it's appropriate that the scale of uh, the challenge uh, with the populations that we have and the um, complexities of them, uh, clearly w our work was cut out for us. So 15-year trajectory, we're almost there. Um, business um, has not, we have not yet been able to achieve the, the MDGs. I, I have to say that we have improved billions of lives and uh, China has been inst integral to that when we talked about uh, reducing poverty by half. Um, but as we say, we still have a lot to do. And uh, 12, 13 years on, things have become more complex. And as we look at a development agenda um, going forward, we have to address that. And, and we believe that the resolutions coming out of Rio um, to address sustainable development, uh, using sustainable development to eradicate poverty is the way to go. Um, having said that, the new challenges that we speak to today around water, energy, and food, there is really a big potential for, for the nexus of this. And the story of the MDGs, um, as we said, was a very different world from now. Uh, today, what we're seeing, among others, is the environmental degradation that's increased. Climate change is so much more evident now. You can be, you're touching and feeling it. Many are uh, certainly reeling from it, particularly in developing countries where we don't have the environment um, for, for resilience there. Uh, and it's already beginning to affect the global water cycle. We see irregular rainfall, more floods, more droughts, um, our agricultural yields have been affected, and they're undermining not only the rights of people, especially the poor, it's also threatening business. We look at the livestock sectors that use 70% of freshwater resources and food systems accounting for up to 30% um, of our GHG emissions. And our food value chain responsible for around 30% of the total energy demand. Now, if things continue the way we are, and I, uh, earlier just as we talked about the tensions between many of the livelihoods that we're addressing for the world's poor, but also the lifestyles that we have to consider looking for alternatives, um, we know that we're going to have to be producing much more food. Uh, certainly the primary energy needs will increase by 50% 2035, and the demand for water will exceed global availability by 40% in 2030. So while we say that the MDG's history has been inspiring, we also know it has its limitations. And, and I think here we have failed to address many of um, the complex interlinkages between water, food, energy, land, soil, climate, and biodiversity. Sustainable and cli uh, climate smart agriculture, therefore, for us as the discussions emerge, has been a good example of how the Nexus approach unfolds. Um, and we know that climate change uh, smart agriculture combines knowledge, policies, practices that simultaneously promote sustainable increases in agricultural productivity and farmers' income, greater resilience in the face of changing climates and reduced greenhouse gas emission. So in a sense, that for us is a triple win already. Uh, and we've seen many examples of this. With the new development agenda, over the last year, we've had many a, an opportunity to speak to the substantive issues within the process. It is a very difficult intergovernmental process. Um, and so bringing some of these issues into that domain have been quite challenging to be specific about it. What will the impacts be? 
Um, but it has seen an unprecedented um, discussion happening between uh, communities, business, governments, a number of reports that have fed in um, to what is emerging as a much more robust framework uh, that would give us a set of goals um, to, to deliver in 2015. Business leaders from all over the world have joined, um, have joined us in this. Uh, the UN Global Compact has been a major player here, and in the UN General Assembly last year, <coughs> we saw a specific report that um, alluded to the global architecture, and I'd be very interested to hear from business, um, if you've had an opportunity to look at that, how you see um, the possible engagement with that um, at, the, uh, at, the, at the country level. Um, the important... The importance of this is that we try to inform the process, but ultimately the implementation, uh, when the rubber really hits the road, is going to be at the country level. And I think what has been warming is that the message has been loud and clear that business is and wants to engage with this. Um, the how we have this conversation to come up with something that is robust at the end um, is going to be, I think, uh, what uh, we all see as a challenge, ensuring that Whatever we do at the end of the day, looking at a balance between people and planet at the center of this that pays for all of us, looking at the consequences if we don't do that, but the potentials of if we do. It's a difficult agenda. For once, we're not looking at just a, through a poverty lens and overseas development assistance. We're looking at domestic resources, unlocking private sector, foreign direct investment in our countries. We're looking at a universal agenda, so this is not just applying to developing countries, it's also applying to the role and responsibility of um, developed countries as well in mobilizing um, all those resources that we need to make uh, this an inclusive and economic transformation. Uh, certainly, young people are a big part of this, um, and young people, we don't say on the outside, but many young businesses, we, we talk much more about just the decent jobs, it is also about entrepreneurs and how to grow those businesses um, with uh, using sustainable patterns um, of consumption, production, and includes uh, a really good uh, participatory monitoring and accountability framework. We do have to change the way we do business. The partnerships need to be redefined. Um, there is always a tension between coming to invest and getting an enabling environment. We need to find more innovative ways of approaching that innovative environment um, that we can begin uh, to make the investments that need to address this at, at scale. So a renewed global partnership and the roles of business um, does need to recognize uh, government's role for creating that partnership and allowing, in, in, in many cases, business lead this. But we have to also hear the, the call of civil society, of communities who are also concerned that there is an accountability, that good business is what we're talking about leading and that people do um, are at the center of this and that business sees dividend and profit um, not off the back of um, the poor, but with the poor and, and uh, they as a very uh, beneficiaries of it. Uh, the multi-stakeholder partnerships are really part of this big shift and they, they're reiterated in the Secretary General's um, report, um, the transformative actions of the post-2015 development agenda have to have that multi-stakeholder partnership. I think in many of the discussions that we've had so far, there have been some role models in business that have shown us the way. They are insufficient at this stage. We need many more people coming across the board to really see how this could be um, actualized um, at the, again, as I say, at the country level. So I'd encourage um, looking at that new uh, global corporate architecture for it to, to happen. Um, encourage that we have a greater engagement with the sectors and, and become much more innovative about how we uh, look at best practice, but best practice to scale. Um, clearly, the, uh, the substantive issues are continue to be uh, discussed, the nexus, as we say, between uh, water, energy, and certainly uh, food are there. I think these eventually, we will have a set of goals that we will be able to respond to. We hope that we keep the ambition and the momentum. What is clearly um, one very important part of this is the means of implementation. That discussion continues to happen now. Um, it will require that many resources are unlocked. What does that mean? Uh, what level of comfort does business require? But what level of responsibility to will um, government and our multilateral organizations need to, to put in that? There are a number of um, UN business partnerships that have, uh, I think, pave the way to show that this can happen. Certainly the sustainable energy for all has already mobilized uh, over $50 billion commitments for achieving three interlinked, interlinked um, objectives by 2030. 
the Secretary General's Zero Hunger Challenge is another um, initiative that, that has also um, put on the on the table the possibilities of minimizing, for instance, wastage of food, 30% uh, of which we know is already being wasted. Um, and we're looking at uh, the welcome proposal uh, put forward uh, by governments on the multi-stakeholder alliance and climate smart agriculture and food security. Um, in conclusion, I'd just like to say that this is an unprecedented opportunity for this new partnership to come. It's a huge challenge, it's not easy. Nobody's going to prescribe or tell us how to do it because in many cases we haven't done it before. And we've not done it to the scale at which we're asking the world to come together to do this. Uh, but we do have to invest in it. The consequences for doing otherwise I think are pretty dire and we're already seeing the evidence of that. Um, but it needs commitment, it needs uh, for us to, to really want to make this work uh, with the partnerships. I think it's a, a huge transformative uh, uh, possibility. Certainly the Institute is well placed to help us uh, bring together those partnerships and the spaces like this that we need outside of the UN uh, to make it a reality. Uh, I look forward to continuing the dialogue um, today and, and as we go along to 2015. Thank you.